Good evening, my dear friends. How are you tonight? I'm fine, I think. Now I am fine. I had some unexpected visitors in my woods this week, and they were less than kind to my home, which always unsettles me a bit, because I do not understand entering a place with unkindness, but to each their own. When my peaceful sanctum is breached by disrespect or meanness, I have taken to simply screaming. Usually the sound of it frightens graspers and defilers away. Not always, but usually. But my voice grows hoarse every time I do that. Even though I'm a spirit of a very strong sort, it takes its toll, raging, doesn't it? And I rage not because people are unkind. I have the wherewithal to know that the rage comes from pride from my pride being wounded at the thought that someone might deliberately want to hurt me. But I think that's pride, too, in a way. For most people do not commit petty acts towards someone, or something, in this case, me and my forest. But rather, they are behaving in the only way they know how to. And I can choose to let it reach me, or not. When someone comes into my woods and exclaims loudly that the trinkets in the trees are ugly, or that the singing coming from my den is horrifying instead of gorgeous, or that the lake seems muddy instead of mysterious, or if they steal the fruit from my generous trees and spit it out in disgust on the ground, I understand that it is no failing of mine, or of the forest but it hurts. And so, sometimes, I scream. But I grow tired of it. The cost is too high. And it is merely pride that makes me scream. Because how can they not know? How can they not know of the spirit in the wood? How can they not have heard tell of my great power? my profound magic. This is a failing on my part, because that means nothing. That is nothing. That is only an illusion in my mind. Identity is only an illusion, I think, and one that perhaps it would be best to let go of. For one's own emotional well-being, one being me. So I sat and asked my cards a question. It wasn't really a question, but I wanted to know about this idea of identity. Tell me about identity, I begged. Can I be free from it? Should I be free from it? How do I free myself from it? What is it worth? Is it worth anything? Please tell me about identity. I drew. Strength. Excellent, lovely, true. The card I drew in my first episode in this forest. And the card I drew for my third All Hallow Tide. The lovely thing about this card is that it challenges your notion of power. It suggests that power comes from not control over others, but influence over others and influence comes from compassion. You can influence others if they listen to you, and people only truly listen to you if you respect them, I think. You can try to wrestle for power over others as much as you want, but if they do not honor and respect you, and feel that you honor and respect them, I think that ultimately it will all be for nothing. I have said before that the strength card speaks to a quiet kind of power, rather than a loud and hungry control. I must fight against loud and hungry control. 
I aspire towards, at best, quiet influence. Now, what does this say of identity? Well, the strength card does not seek external validation. I think identity is intrinsically linked to the need for external validation. My pride would not be so wounded if I did not expect others to fear and respect me. Pride can retreat when identity is no longer necessary, maybe. And I think strength, the strength to genuinely care for and try to reach others, the strength to gain influence through not seeking it, the elevating of love over dominance, can be achieved through devaluing identity. Perhaps. I also believe that the strength card represents bravery in the face of someone else trying to exert control and gain power over others unjustly. Only the truly strong can look a powerful, lying monster in the face and tell them that they are wrong, that they are causing hurt, and that stopping them is a worthy cause. I have many thoughts about strength, and I often don't feel very strong. I didn't when I drew this card, in fact. So maybe it's in these moments, these times of fear and weakness, that the strength card is even more precious a card to draw. I have a story. A story about a person, like you or me, who found the strength to fight, even in the face of a most powerful and dark and brutal force. I will say that I find this story frightening at times, because you see this story is about fear, so I will gently warn you about this. But I also want you to know that I am here, constructing it for you, telling it to you, and every time a frightening image appears in your mind, I will hold your hand, and you know the kinds of stories I write, don't you? If you do, then I hope you'll trust that I'll take you to sunny skies on the other end. Strength is enduring the darkness, and perhaps creating your own light. Bear with me. Our story tonight is about someone who inherited a haunted house from a distant and eccentric great-uncle. But, in order to win this strange and unexpected prize, they had to prove their worth by surviving one night alone in this terrifying place. What, have you heard this one before? What do you mean it sounds familiar? Strange. I thought it all sounded quite far-fetched, if you ask me. But what do I know? I'm just a forest spirit. Our young protagonist was quite the cunning character. Smart as a whip, too, and with a gleam in their eye that often brought luck and good fortune their way. I'm not really sure what luck is. Whether or not it's real and whether or not it touches some people and chooses to overlook others. I do not think such a force exists in this world, personally. But if it did, it must have touched this person then, for they found themselves constantly having good opportunities almost hand-delivered to their doorstep. Job offers, romantic prospects, countless friendships... And rather than grow tired of every blessing, this remarkable anomaly of an individual continued to be grateful. Their smile grew brighter and sweeter and kinder with every passing day, and this caused everyone around them to be absolutely enamored and in their thrall. And the day that the lawyer had come to their door with the sad news that an uncle our protagonist had honestly never heard of had died, and that they, as the only surviving family member, were to inherit their old and vast estate, that day, 
They truly felt gratitude and joy and love and grief for the anonymous family member. And they booked a train ticket that day and read the documents on the long journey. A haunted house, they thought, finding it a little odd that those were the exact words used in their uncle's will. I didn't think there was such a thing. I suppose I shall find out at any rate, they said, and stared amazedly at the trees, the river, the farmland, passing by the train. Arriving at the train station and then hiring a driver to take them to the isolated house in the middle of nowhere, the excitement of a new and mysterious place caught up with our lucky protagonist. Entering through the front door, it was clear that this place was dominated by fear, by a looming dread, a kind of silent noise, if that makes any sense, louder than screaming could ever be. But it was a beautiful, big place. It could be lovely, it could be bright, it could be very, very livable indeed. And so, its new owner found that they were still very grateful. Even as they unpacked their bags upstairs, and were certain that they saw in the dusty mirror, and only for a split second, three children with empty eyes and mouths frozen open in screams. The new owner turned around quickly, but the children were not there. Our protagonist froze, heart pounding, certain of what they'd seen. Can't say I wasn't warned, they thought to themselves, gathered their courage, and despite the fear, kept going on their path. Soon, after all the lamps and candles had been lit to make the place just a little brighter, they found themselves in the kitchen, making up a delightful little meal, singing songs to themselves to try and drown out that dreadful silence. Until suddenly... It had come from right behind them, along with what sounded like a breath on the back of their neck, and felt like an unbearably cold breeze. But they kept going. I am not wasting this good food on fear. So they kept on humming, and simply lit another candle. Now, our new homeowner heard the drumming from the basement, and they still heard the wailing. And while certainly the fear was still there, there was also a faint whisper of something else, more than annoyance and a little less than anger, but not much less. Because this was their house now, and they would not be bullied out of it. Not by anything. But finally, one thing was able to finally distract them. Above the stove was a window, with lovely pale white curtains, perhaps a bit dusty, but easily washed. Only a few feet away, outside, there was a woman wearing all white, hovering a foot off the ground, bobbing a little as though floating underwater. Her eyes, 
like those of the ghastly children from before, were empty too, and her face frozen in an open expression of horror. She looked like she was screaming, but no sound came from her throat. Her hands seemed to be up in some kind of warning. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. He's here. Our hero heard her say, though the sound came not from her, but from all around. And then she simply disappeared. Our brave one's heart pounded in their chest even harder now. Who was coming? And would it truly be worth staying to find out? Our brave hero turned around slowly, a dish in hand, to take the food to the living room, where they hoped to listen to a little radio and perhaps calm their nerves a bit. But right before them, in the house now, face still frozen, was that woman and the three children and a man, eyes empty and mouth screaming too. Our hero dropped the plate, and it shattered to the ground, and the poor, ghostly family disappeared again. But you understand how the rest of the night passed, yes? There were too many ghosts here. Dozens. But how could one even begin to count? Ghosts from years and years long past. Had they all lived and died here once? Or were they drawn to this place? They seemed to be imprisoned here, at any rate, and in a frozen state of horror, each and every one of them. Looking in from the windows, peering from the mirrors, waiting around the corners. Even as our protagonist simply sat and listened to the radio, no longer feeling comfortable exploring in the darkness. They made themselves known, appearing briefly in the hall entrance before disappearing, or directly beside them on the couch to reach out with desperate arms outstretched, or even standing upside down on the ceiling. They were everywhere. The sounds of wailing spirits ringing out through the attic and the pounding of drums rumbling from the basement, the flashes of shadows moving in the candlelight, and eerily glowing spirits peering in through the windows here and there. The shaking of the chandelier, the slamming of the cabinet doors, it was all too terrible and too awful. And whenever our once lucky now a very unlucky hero opened their eyes to look anywhere. All they saw were horrified and horrific phantasms. It was almost overwhelming. Go escape. He knows. He knows. Leave this place. Leave, leave us. I must tell you that it began to rain in the story, because it's raining here in my woods. Can you hear it? Beautiful. Take a breath if you need to. Then we'll continue. Finally, after several hours of trying to remain calm and brave and quiet and still, amid all of this supernatural chaos, our protagonist had simply had enough of this. They were cold. They were hungry. They were exhausted. This place was completely inhospitable and entirely dreadful. They screamed at the top of their lungs, in a way that I will not now, of course, for everything and everyone haunting this dreadful place to stop. Stop. 
and it did. For a time. Until, from the silence, from the basement, the drums started again. No, not drums, footsteps, heavy and certain and hard like steel. Trembling, our brave one collected their wits and pulled two chairs away from the table. They sat in one, and they stared at the other. Boom, boom, boom went those footsteps, like cinder blocks being dropped one at a time. And one by one, the ghosts who had been frightened away from the screamed command only a moment ago reappeared, faintly, here and there, some peering in from the windows again, others lingering in door frames down the hall, others impossibly looking in through the crystal cabinets. They were everywhere, and they were shaking. They were very afraid. But our brave one waited and sat and breathed deeply. Soon the smell of sulfur, the smell of rotting flesh, the smell of burning hair flooded the room, and those footsteps entered with the sound of hoarse breathing, snarling and angry. And beyond the candlelight, through the shadows, our brave one saw eyes white and cruel. All of the candles went out then, and the room was completely dark. Your soul is mine. Everything here is mine. Here is mine. Despair. 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 For you are my despair. 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 For you have nothing. For you are nothing. The sound was right in our brave and currently very unlucky one's ear. As their eyes adjusted to the darkness and the moonlight streamed in. And the rain poured even harder. Can you hear it? Can you hear it even still? They could make out the faces of each and every frightened ghost in the room again. Still shaking, still cowering, some running and fleeing, some weeping. And they could see, in their peripheral vision, the shadowy face of this horrible, dark spirit, this demon, this void of a soul whatever it was, that sought misery and pain and power, power over everything it could. And our protagonist did nothing. They didn't move a muscle. They didn't speak. They did nothing. Whatever it was, the horrible thing from the basement... It was made of spirit only, and yet when it dragged a putrid claw, long and curved like a tiger's, down our brave one's face, it hurt, and it bled, but they did not scream. I'm not playing, they said simply. What did you say? The demon roared. I'm not playing this game. If you want someone to terrify, you have enough souls here who will do that for you. But I don't want to do that. I'm not interested, thank you. And at that, the other ghosts, the ones who had been so fearful and anguished before, 
ceased to wail and weep and scream and shake. They all went silent. Some even drew a little closer, amazed to learn that they had simply ignored the fact that they could have just refused to play. The demon threatened and cackled and growled. All mine, all mine, all mine. Our brave one raised their eyebrows and nodded. I see. Well, I won't speak for anyone else, but no, I am not yours. That's ridiculous. <gasps> A gasp. From one ghost, a single surprised laugh from another, a horrible roar from the demon. Are you done, or would you like to scratch me again? And at that, the demon sprang forward, claws out, more than willing to take the brave one up on their offer. However, this time, all of the other ghosts, every single one of them, no longer quite so afraid, some of them anyway, leapt forward too, to all together hold the demon back. Because, though it was more powerful than each one of them individually, of course it did not have the power to stop all of them. And the thing from the basement, whatever it was, finally took a seat. Why are you here? I was drawn to this place full of death and misery. I am not miserable. Not yet. Maybe so. But today, I am not miserable. Do you know why? The demon remained quiet. And the sun began to peek through the window. The birds began to sing outside, and the night had passed. Our brave protagonist had won. They simply smiled and said, No matter what you do, I will not be afraid of you. Not in my own home. And the demon's white eyes widened in its own kind of fear as it began to be pulled, as though an invisible person had grabbed its left hand out the door of the house. Slowly but certainly, it was being dragged out by some force. The demon grabbed at the walls, clawing at the wallpaper. It stomped its feet like a petulant child. It still roared and growled and screamed. And then it was resigned. For you see, it used to make the rules in this place. But everyone else here... The new owner, each and every ghost of a human who once lived here, had decided those rules were no longer worth upholding. Were they ever? And so, now with eyes no longer empty, but rather painted with many different and unique colors, faces no longer frozen, and voices restored, they all stood, either on the front porch, or in the windows in the upstairs bedrooms and the front halls. And our brave protagonist stood in the open door frame, as the demon was pulled out of the house, as though from a supernatural security guard. And they all waved goodbye. And there were sunny skies again, 
just as I promised. Did I visit the house someday later in my vast and strange fictional life? Yes. I was very afraid at first. But then I saw a brave, smiling spirit, who I could just tell was very lucky. If luck were a thing to actually exist, which I don't think it does, but who can say? They said to me, You don't have to be afraid, you know, just because there are ghosts here. There's no rule that says so. And I smiled in return, realizing they were absolutely correct. Good night, my dear friends. Do not be afraid. There's no rule that says you must be. Sweet dreams. Hi everybody, and welcome to On a Dark, Cold Night. This is Kristen Zaza, the writer, host, podcaster, performer, composer, and team of one behind the podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me for episode 152. I do so love a haunted house story, but they frighten me terribly. I hope you don't mind that I felt like exploring that a little tonight. And of course, now the rain is starting to let up a little bit. If you're interested in supporting what I do here at On a Dark Cold Night, a great way to do so is to become a monthly patron through Patreon.com, where, as a perk, every monthly supporter receives access to my ever-updated soundtrack. You can learn more at Patreon.com slash DarkColdNight. And I'd love to take a moment to send a quick thank you to all of my patrons who support me there. It means the world to me. If you'd prefer to donate one time only without the soundtrack perk, you can also donate via coffee.com. You can find my page and learn more about that at ko-fi.com slash darkcoldnight. And if you'd like to own some wearable merch, I have t-shirts and hoodies available at bonfire.com slash on-a-dark-cold-night. A great way of helping the show out in a non-financial way is to leave a review and a rating for me on iTunes. You can also write your thoughts at my Facebook page or anywhere else you like to review podcasts. If you'd like to keep in touch, send a shout out, see what I'm up to, please feel free to follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter at a dark cold night, Instagram at dark cold night podcast, and my Facebook and YouTube pages are just called on a dark cold night. It's a great way to keep in the loop with the podcast. Today, as in the day before releasing this episode, I decided to post little Instagram stories with videos showing what my day creating each podcast episode tends to look like warts and all. So hey, that's the kind of content you can catch on social media if you check me out there. Thank you so much again for listening with me tonight. I don't know why this was a particularly fearsome week for me, but that's probably why I created what, in my opinion, was a particularly fearsome story. But I hope you don't mind. I hope you have a peaceful sleep tonight. Take care of yourself. Stay strong in the kindest possible way, both to yourself and to others. Good night, my friends. This podcast has been brought to you by the Sonar Network. Sonar.